Okay, now we are all set. So I'll let you go. Uh, let's get started. Okay, uh, Shujit, thank you very much um, for the invitation and the uh, and the very kind introduction. Uh, so I'll be, uh, as Shujit said, I've, a lot of my research work has been on this class of systems called active matter. And today I'll tell you about one particular angle on that, which has to do with uh, interactions that are in a certain sense uh, non-reciprocal. Uh, and uh, my work has been supported by grants from SERB India and the Tata Trust. Um, so I, I'll uh, spend a little time telling the audience what active matter is and what I mean by non reciprocal uh, interactions. And then I'll uh, tell you three short stories in which uh, non reciprocal interactions play a nice uh, role. Uh, so my slides are acting up, just a second. Don't worry, it can be a little slow at times, but <clears throat> no need to. Uh, just a sec. Yeah. Um, yeah, for some reason, it's not showing the previous slide. Yeah, it'll catch right. up probably. No, no, so I mean, let me just, so mm -hmm. I, let me use a non-display slide for a moment. Okay. Uh, so active matter, you know, just has to do with particles that are in some sense self-propelled or autonomously taking in uh, available free energy and doing something. And the active state obviously needs to be maintained by a sustained uh, free energy input. So you, you, these active things have to either have a fuel tank on board or have the ability to draw nutrient from their immediate surroundings and metabolize it and do something. And people, you know, you can sort of take the kinds of problems you do in condensed matter physics or statistical physics like looking at gases or liquids or liquid crystals and ask what if those same systems were made of these autonomously motile particles. And then you could imagine studying a suspension of midges or um, a liquid, a, a developing tissue which on long time scales is like a liquid or a weird liquid crystal like, uh, like uh, this system which is a collection of uh, millipedes uh, here on the University, of, actually on the University of Hyderabad campus, uh, which are aligning with each other. And actually, even in this little video, you can get a little sense of why the interactions are non-reciprocal in these systems. Because you've got one of these creatures sneaking up on another from behind and uh, trying to catch up and the other one in front, not responding in the same way to the one behind as the one behind responds to the one in front. So even in this living liquid crystal, in a certain sense, the physics of non-mutuality or non-reciprocality uh, can be seen. But more on that uh, in a moment. Uh, so basically what I mean, uh, sorry, I have one question. Is the little box on the side with a few of our faces showing on your screens? Uh, <clears throat> I can see it. Uh, no, no, yeah. is it coming in the way? I'm just trying to figure out how I can move it out of the way. Uh, can move, you, we can individually move it. You can do that. All right, um, fine. All right. Yeah. So it doesn't bother you? Uh, no, you can go to the top right and, and you can fiddle with it if you want. Uh, there, there, well, there should be a bunch of things in the top right, extreme top right. But uh, it's fine. You can, you can drag the whole thing and then put it at the top of the screen so that it will be away from the... Yeah, know. that's more or less the best I can do, I guess. Correct, okay, yeah. Fine. Yeah, so, yeah. Active matter is made of objects we'll call active particles. So the model, I mean, the sort of the, the thing that active matter is trying to describe is living stuff. So living systems or their energy consuming or free energy consuming components or various artificial realizations uh, are all active particles. The key point about any of these particles is that, uh, about active matter is active particles have detailed balance broken at the level of the constituent particles. So each uh, component particle breaks uh, time reversal invariance dissipatively by virtue of the fact that it's constantly supplied with free energy. It uses that up, spits out waste, and this process is driven in a one-way manner. And so that's what you mean by an active particle. And collections of active particles uh, are active matter. And you can actually take 
more familiar objects like conventional Langevin equations include a chemical degree of freedom, drive that chemical degree of freedom in a one-way manner, and effectively produce the equations governing active matter. And this is described in various places, including a sort of short article uh, in the stat phase uh, proceedings from 2016. Um, and if you ask about you know, what kinds of realizations, the point is this theme recurs on many different scales. A collection of macroorganisms uh, is a big, huge active material. An organized collection of cells in one organism is also an active material. An organized component, collection of active components inside a cell, the, you know, all the components of the cell or just the cytoskeleton and the motors or just the nucleus and uh, the uh, uh, transcriptional apparatus, all of these are different kinds of active matter. You can also make nice minimal model systems. You can get material from cells and take a few very well-defined purified components like biofilaments, motors, and the chemical fuel needed to run them and reconstitute them into uh, an artificial active matter system. Or you can take totally non-biological systems, some kind of particle, some kind of free energy input, uh, and the particle has enough structure to turn that free energy input into something interesting. So you can make uh, self-propelled objects of various kinds, which I'll say a little bit about. Uh, so basically, you know, it's what Leibniz uh, said about uh, living organisms, that they're machines in which each part is a machine. I don't know how it is actually said, but uh, Dan Needleman and Zvonimir Jogic uh, quote uh, Leibniz as having said this here. Anyway, um, so apart from those living uh, examples, there are interesting non-living realizations, uh, including chemically propelled colloids, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, or Imagine what you have here is the top view of a surface on which, uh, and that surface is actually vibrating up and down. That is, say it's, it's, that plane is shaking up and down like this. And on it, you've got a particle. You've got one single particle here in this case with a nose and a tail. You happen to also have a bunch of beads around, which will be interesting for later part of this talk. And this particle takes the vertical shaking and by virtue of its shape, transduces it into horizontal motion, thus. And my claim is that from, for physics purposes, this is in many ways as good an example of active matter as a real self-propelled organism, because the particle at all times is in contact with an energy source. The tilt coordinate of the particle, the out-of-plane tilt of this rod, um, and the way it couples to the base are like a little machine which takes this vertical shaking and transduces it into horizontal motion. So this is a nice little um, self-propelled or active uh, particle. Okay, now I'm not able to uh, stop this movie because I can't find the... Uh... Oh dear. There's something very strange going on here, which is that... Okay. So there you go. Yeah, Did but now have... I don't have my talk, do I? <laughs> It'll come back, I'm sure. Yeah, it's back. There yeah. Go. yeah. All right. You can imagine something even more uh, seemingly exotic. Imagine you have a two-dimensional material, say a 2D metal. And imagine it's in contact. It's, it's two faces are in contact with two fat leads. And imagine the two leads are maintained at different chemical potential. Okay? That is your... They, so what you're doing is you're taking this 2D object and you're driving a current of anything, of particles, of electrons, through it, perpendicular to it. In that case, the physics in that gray two-dimensional plane of the material is the physics of a material that is subjected to a sustained energy throughput. So the dynamics of that uh, two-dimensional material is a kind of active dynamics. And this has been exploited actually in trying to understand uh, spontaneous current states in uh, two DEGs uh, subject to uh, microwave agitation and so forth. So you can imagine many different kinds of realizations. I will talk only about a limited subset of these uh, today. Uh, and of course, you know, the motivation for studying this whole subject is to understand, is to bring living matter into the fold of, yes? So is there a question? No, no, I, Constantino, uh, Constantino, can you mute yourself? Okay, I think that's okay. 
Okay. Um, sorry, idea is to bring a living matter into the fold of condensed matter physics. And there's, you know, interesting new physics. And uh, it's an important first step in, uh, uh, you know, putting, uh, looking at biological systems from uh, a physics point of view. The success of active matter actually lies in being not too ambitious and focusing only on mechanics, uh, particularly self-propulsion or motility and contractility, which is the way in which uh, motors act, uh, swimmers act in fluids or motors act in the cytoskeleton, and keeping a very simple local description in which the particles aren't endowed with too much foresight uh, or planning and so forth. Eventually, of course, it would be nice to put in the more truly definitive properties of living matter into these systems, sensing, signaling, self-replication, and so forth. But the more of that you put in, the harder it is to maintain a simple physicist's active matter viewpoint. So we'll keep it very simple in this talk and in most of my, all of my work, really. Okay. Now, as a kind of matter, you'd like to classify the types of particles and the states of organization. So you can have uh, sort of scalar active particles, little blobs of uh, little droplets that are chemically propelled, which may transiently have a head as they move in a certain direction because the reaction around the surface has some asymmetry. Or you could have particles that are explicitly structurally vectorial. You can have particles that are structurally uh, uniaxial but don't have head and tail. You can have particles whose shape is, you, is apolar, but whose motion is polar. And these particles can organize themselves into states with macroscopic, vectorial, or polar order. Or you can imagine that even though the particles are polar, they align their axes but don't care about head and tail and therefore produce apolar but uniaxial states. Or you could have uniaxial order because the particles themselves don't know head from tail. You can also have more conventional kinds of uh, phase ordering, such as as would be described by a scalar order parameter like condensation. Uh, and in fact, much recent interest in the field has been not in looking at living examples of liquid crystals, but just uh, ordinary you know, phase separation or condensation in active systems. Um, this is a field which is blessed with a, an excess of review articles. Uh, we wrote a, one that played an important role in 2013, but there's been a lot uh, since then. Uh, in addition to the symmetries of the particles, uh, we're interested in different kinds of dynamical regimes. Now, normally when you look at the phase diagram of a thermal equilibrium system, uh, if you specify the pair potentials between the particles, then regardless of whether those particles are in a momentum conserving you know, bulk fluid or on a substrate, you will get the, the same phase diagram. But in non-equilibrium systems, changing the dynamical ensemble changes the phase diagram. Uh, so we like to distinguish wet and dry active matter uh, using those adjectives, not in the sense that Feynman did in his lectures. In Feynman's lectures, wet and dry referred to viscous and inviscid fluids. Here, when I say wet, I mean in bulk fluid, and dry means you know, on dry terrain. And you can clearly have spatial ordering of active systems in both those cases. Okay. Um, a brief word on flocking models. Uh, they have their origin partly in the animal behavior literature, but also uh, in Hollywood from a computer scientist who was making uh, movies of, uh, of uh, stampedes and things. And he made simple rules that if the particles avoid crowding each other too much, but are gregarious, so they move towards each other, and when they are near each other, they adopt the average heading of their neighbors, then as a function of particle density and noise, you go from a randomly pointed state to a state that is macroscopically oriented and macroscopically moving in a global, globally selected direction. You also have a very interesting intermediate state uh, in which you have bands that are moving. They're all aligned with each other and moving in the same direction. The system is actually a striped phase. And this interesting phase diagram is now, I think, broadly agreed upon. And probably the group that did the most uh, to clarify this is Yukshate and company. Uh, Toner and two did something very interesting. They showed that these kinds of order, even though the order parameter as a two-dimensional vector is an XY order parameter, uh, these systems have true long range order. And I'll come briefly to that in part one of the talk. 
Okay. So I'm still on my introduction. I've already used uh, nearly so 18 minutes. Sorry. Okay. But let me tell you a little bit about the other uh, interesting thing about active systems, which is that interactions are generically non-reciprocal. Now, clearly, you know, in, in social interactions, A can be attracted to B and B can be repelled by A, something would, which would never happen if the interaction was based on a pair potential. Uh, the interaction between locusts that produces global alignment of locust swarms seems to actually be cannibalism. You've got a, the locust at the back tries to eat the locust in front, and the locust in front runs away from the locust at the back. And the effect of this, as uh, Vishu Guttal, now at the Institute of Science, but then a postdoc with uh, Ian Cousin uh, showed, is an aligning interaction. Uh, more generally, uh, in the context of magnetism, non-mutual interactions have another name, which is asymmetric exchange, something which, again, you can't have in a magnet governed by an energy function, but you can have in uh, more general uh, spin models, such as uh, Hopfield uh, neural nets, where if you want to store uh, states with a time sequence, or if you want to model certain kinds of oscillatory motor uh, activity, uh, asymmetric exchange couplings are a natural thing to put in. So the reason I'm mentioning that actually is that even though in this talk I'm going to tell you about three non-reciprocal stories in conventional active matter, my interest in non-reciprocal interactions actually began uh, many years ago when uh, Madan Rao, his student Jajit Das and I uh, were studying um, uh, sorry, were studying um, the minimal, so we asked ourselves a question, supposing you have a Heisenberg magnet, isotropic, and supposing all the interactions respect isotropy in uh, spin space, but supposing the system in space, not spin, in real space has a preferred direction, supposing x and minus x aren't equivalent. And supposing you drive this system out to equilibrium in some generic way, you know, pump it with energy in some isotropic manner, what will the equation of motion look like? Okay, what will be the simplest, the minimal equation of motion you can write down for a system of this sort? Well, the claim is that given that you're driving it out of equilibrium, you're no longer obliged to get the magnetic field whose torque rotates the spins uh, from an energy function. You can say that the, the effective field felt by spin i uh, comes from spin i plus one and spin i minus one, but in principle, a given spin can see a different exchange coupling for the spin in front of it than behind it recurrently. I can, this spin can see a different exchange coupling coming from that spin from that which that spin sees coming from this spin. So if you do that, you get a very interesting um, dynamics you get uh, basically any kind of state you try to construct seems to be unstable. And you get a wildly unstable magnet and spatial temporal chaos. Uh, but uh, this theme will come back in what I'm going to talk about in a little while. A way of seeing it is the following. Imagine this is one spin, this is another spin. And each exerts a torque on the other to try to line it up. The point is if these exchange couplings are asymmetric, this guy could do less of the turning to line up with this guy, and this guy could do more of the turning to line up with that guy. The net result is that the pair of spins will borrow a, a turning moment from the ambient medium. You'll spoil spin conservation. Okay. Anyway, so um, now let me come to the first actual research part of my talk, uh, which was work by my student Lokar Shi, uh, in collaboration with Ananyo, a former student now at uh, Paris and Rahul Chajwa and Jitendra. Uh, the story basically is not about spin systems, it's about flocks. And we think of flocks as systems in which you have particles which have a sort of head and a tail and which move. And we also, the understanding of why flocks get long range order from Toner and two has to do with their motion. So I'll show you today how that's not necessarily so, okay? So let's consider a bunch of uh, two-dimensional vectors. Uh, I think I've used a bad notation. Yeah, I have. I've messed up. When I, in this part of the talk, I sometimes say P 
and sometimes say V, they are unfortunately the same thing. I clean forgot to fix this. Okay, let's consider a bunch of little vectors PI. And uh, let's treat them as little rotors. And let's keep track of their classical spin angular momentum, SI, about their own center of mass. So you've got a little vector like this. It's a little vector PI and it turns and the rate at which it turns is uh, the magnitude of SI is the rate at which it turns and the direction of SI is in the Z direction, perpendicular to the XY plane. And so let's write down a complete inertial dynamics of this system. So then if these were real ob physical objects, mechanical objects with a, with a turn moment of inertia chi, then PI dot would be the angular velocity cross PI. And if they interacted with each other, such as to try to align, that alignment would come through a torque, J I J P J summed on the neighbors J, which would reorient, which would change the angular momentum, right? Through this kind of an equation of motion. If these particles are in contact with the medium, the angular momentum is damped at a rate given by eta over chi times SI. So now if you consider a system, so remember what I've done, I've not made these particles move linearly in space. The only thing these particles do is they have an orientation and they have a classical spin angular momentum. You can think of them, you can, they could be diffusing around, but they have no motility in the sense that they don't travel themselves in the direction in which they're pointing. Okay. But supposing these particles, now, now think of these particles, imagine these particles have a perceptual cone. Imagine each one mostly sees in the front and a little bit on the side or something, sees poorly behind it. Then you can imagine that the tendency of a particle to respond to the spin to the little rotor in front of it is going to be quite different from the tendency of the rotor in front to respond to this one, right? So it's natural in a system like this to think of Jij not equal to Jji, okay? So if you do that, so let's say you say that Jij is J plus something, and that something is a constant A times the cosine of the angle between how you are pointing and the separation vector to your neighbor, okay? So what will happen is that the guys in, on, let us say in front, will have a coupling J plus A and from behind a coupling J minus A. What happens? Let's take this dynamics and promote it to a continuum theory. Let's take a P field and S field. Then P dot will be one over chi S cross P. We'll take a unit vector P. S dot will be P cross. Now this is the part that requires a little bit of algebra. We have a coupling, which is J plus A in front and J minus A behind. So what you'll, you can think of this, there's going to be a, a J coupling for everybody and an A coupling, which changes sign. The result will be that you'll get a P cross the forward derivative of P with a coefficient A and P cross del squared P as in the usual Heisenberg dynamics uh, from J. Okay, and you also damp uh, the angular momentum overall. So by the way, feel free to stop me if something is not clear. Uh, I can even fail to finish the talk, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, so you should see the interesting thing here is you've got a P cross a first derivative of P. Now, just a moment. Yeah, okay. Supposing you didn't have this asymmetry, then you'd have P dot is S cross P, S dot is P cross del squared P. And supposing for a moment you forget the damping, then P dot is S cross P, S dot is P cross del squared P will actually give you, for small perturbations about the aligned state, you'll get these sort of turning waves as in the work of uh, Andrea Cavagna and group in one bit of which uh, I was involved. Uh, and the turning wave speed will be given by this stiffness J. Now, instead, if you take these same equations 
and go to the long time, low, sort of the low frequency limit, then you can disregard ds over dt in favor of eta over chi times s. So forget inertia. In that case, s is determined by p through this equation, right? And you can go back to the p equation, replace s by its expression in terms of p, and you get an equation of motion for p in which the four aft asymmetry of the interaction enters as a self advection of p so p is simply an orientation but because we allowed a, an interaction not coming from an energy function p has proved itself capable of advecting itself p acts uh, like Shriram? A, yes uh, Shriram, just yeah. curious can you can you describe this dynamics uh, this is a hamiltonian dynamics no, this is not a Hamiltonian dynamics. First of all, there's, what, uh, dis yeah. there's dissipation. Secondly, as I said back here, the torques yeah. do not come from an energy function because I've made J i j have an energy function. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Continue. Yeah. yeah but if you, if you throw away this antisymmetry, then it is the Hamiltonian dynamics of a rotor lattice. If you throw away mm -hmm. the antisymmetric part of the coupling and if you throw away damping, then it is Hamiltonian. And that becomes the rotor lattice in Chicken Lubensky chapter eight. My main point, though, is to demonstrate that the moment you introduce this antisymmetric part of the interaction, P advects itself. P behaves like the velocity vector of the Navier Stokes equation. A local disturbance here is carried. And the remarkable thing is that this equation, if you augment it with noise, is basically a hard spin or fixed length version of the Toner 2 equation. Uh, it happens in this particular case to be the Toner 2 equation without an accompanying concentration field. So you have an orientational order parameter with an interaction that favors alignment and a term that says that order parameter is not a vector in the internal space, but points in space, but moreover, advects itself in space. So it, the advective nonlinearity, which Toner and 2 showed leads to long range order in this uh, flocking model emerges not from the order parameter being a velocity as such, but simply from breaking detail balance, thereby allowing terms in the, thereby allowing non reciprocality, non mutuality in the coupling. That's all you need. Self advection emerges from non mutual interactions. And uh, you can carry, so that's point one, that the, the very mechanism that makes flocking order long ranged doesn't really require a flock in the sense of a collection of moving objects. It just requires information to move around. It requires the way the spin points to dictate the way in which the information moves. That's all it means. Um, you can carry this a little bit further in, in more detail. And if you carry out this elimination of the fast angular momentum variable a little more carefully, uh, not to, you know, so if you like, when you drop inertia in favor of damping, what you're doing is you're working to leading order in one over eta. If you work to leading and next order in one over eta, then what you find is this same mechanism that produced the four aft asymmetry actually also leads to a sort of inadequate um, leads to ultimately an instability. If you, the, the, if you uh, expand in powers of one over damping and perturb about uniformly ordered state, what you find is that the effective diffusivity of the orientation variable gets a correction, which is always negative uh, at second order in the asymmetry. So if, you, if the information asymmetry, the four aft asymmetry of information becomes too large, the flock breaks up through a sort of bending instability. So basically, if the long wavelength kinematic wave speed uh, exceeds the short wavelength turning wave speed, the whole flock goes unstable. It's not clear whether this has biological significance, but it tells you that this curiously, the same agency that reinforces long range order can actually destroy the flock. Okay, um, and this instability 
at long, in the turning wave regime is a wave like uh, propagating mode and in the uh, toner two regime it, it has interesting character basically you can calculate the log of the growth rate as a function of uh, wave number and uh, there are various regimes no one's really done experiments on a system like this the numerical studies we did we didn't fix the particles on a lattice and therefore what would happen is when they when the instability kicked in the particles would just disperse so i don't know how interesting the instability is in my view the most interesting thing is the fact that four off asymmetry and broken detail balance suffice to give you long range flocking order without anybody actually traveling okay so that's the summary of part 1 2d xy long range order out of equilibrium doesn't actually need motility it just needs broken detail balance and four off asymmetry and uh, this very this came out recently um uh, you can read more about it if you like okay now any questions on this part okay shall i go on okay okay and another context in which um uh, uh, non reciprocal interactions arise very naturally is in a uh, self propelled colloid so now we leave these uh, flocking models uh, one of the nicest realizations of active matter is these colloidal microswimmers which are actually particles one side of which is a catalyst and if you put it in a medium which contains a compound that the catalyst breaks down then as long as you keep the concentration of that catalyst maintain you keep the fuel basically what happens is that these particles start running around and they don't do run in motion they run around like this okay they're motile and uh, uh, beautiful work by golasania nazdari in liverpool which showed uh, which i think independent of these experiments explained how these systems work the basic idea is imagine you've got a particle the particle could even be spherical okay and imagine it's got a cap so this shading is a little weird uh, you are supposed to see here a dark red patch and a pale background okay so the dark red patch is catalyst the colloid is a catalytic cap uh, the vector telling uh, pointing through this north pole i'll call n i'm not sure i'll use it again imagine you've got a medium around which contains reactant and assume the reactant is somehow abundantly supplied okay so then what will happen is because the conversion of reactant to product takes place here dominantly and not here along the surface of the particle you have a solute gradient so that means along the surface of the particle you have a kind of uh, osmotic flow if you keep maintaining that solute gradient you will get a surface uh, slip velocity because there's a there's a surface uh, gradient of this uh, there's a gradient of the surface energy okay so if you got a particle on whose surface you got a slip velocity going this way let's say then the particle will swim that way so as long as you can maintain the uh, solute gradient on the particle surface you get something that moves it's basically a way of implementing in a permanent manner uh, the same mechanism as is well known in colloid science as diffusive hysis electrophoresis etc If you got a particle and you place a field place a chemical potential, potential gradient and the particle moves because of a slip flow on the surface and the way you work this out is that you know you the the product the solute the the product reaction reaction product diffuses it's produced on the surface at a certain rate and you can put these in and you can then work out the dynamics of one particle you can work out the dynamics of one particle in a background uh, reactant gradient for example so you can imagine you maintain a source of reactant to have a particle this particle can then come around and do funny orbits and so forth uh, around that reactant gradient or imagine you've got a uniform medium of reactant and you have two particles now those two particles will interact at long range because each is modifying the solute field that the other feels and uh, don't worry too much about the equations basically you're looking at the positions of the two particles the orientations of the two particles and you can derive equations of motion basically because um when you solve the fluid dynamics problem that's generated that's produced by 
this uh, solute gradient on the particle surface, you will get the flows, which will determine how the particle travels, and you'll get the gradient of the flow, which will determine how the particle reorients. So if you take the particle and place it in a, so in a reactant field with a gradient, the particle will reorient with respect to that gradient. So the particle does a weird kind of chemotaxis because the flows set up around it turn it to point in different directions. So if you have two particles like this, you can get some really cool dynamics, uh, which I'll just show you in pictures. And I just want to highlight one thing. That is, if you have a pair of particles, one of which ha reacts to the other by wanting to point towards it, and this particle, which wants, so, you know, this particle, let's say, likes to point towards that particle, and this particle liking to point away from that particle, is one of the natural outcomes of uh, this type of dynamics. If you like the, the uh, I thought I had the words there. Okay. The key point is that the motility of these particles is determined by uh, the direction in which they point. So when you've got two particles, it's true that the central mass of the particle itself can get moved around as a result of gradient, but the dominant mechanism that determines which way a particle moves is which way it's pointing. So a gradient of solute produced by one particle reorients the other particle. Okay? So then you can easily see that even if you have two particles of the same type, if one is in front and the other is behind, this one can reorient to point to this guy and that one can move and you can get pursuit and other kinds of straights in this uh, system. So the point is you can get a very rich range of dynamics, including weird things like these uh, waltzes in these systems. So my point was to illustrate with this is I've come to the end of part two of my talk. I may have gone a little past. Uh, non reciprocal interactions, therefore, are inevitable in active colloids. Um, so the kinds of orbits you can produce in these systems, therefore, are rather dramatic. Um, the real interest in these active colloids is uh, to be able to deliver cargo and so forth. And I have not talked about those kinds of things. But uh, clearly, understanding how these particles move in solute gradients becomes very important if you want to use these particles for control delivery and ideas of that sort. Uh, an aspect that's been explored very little, if at all, is the competition between these phoretic and chemotactic types of interactions in these particles and uh, flocking, where you align the velocities. The natural interactions that come out of this active colloid story tend to form asters, tend to form things where particles point to each other or uh, rotate. Uh, but you could imagine flocking being brought in by having particles of asymmetric shape. And then for purely packing reasons, they might flock. But the competition between flocking and other interactions has really been very little studied. Um, a kind of some idea of the richness of the dynamics uh, of these kinds of particles can be seen in a paper that we wrote uh, last year with Suropriya Saha, who is at uh, NPI uh, Göttingen uh, with uh, Ramin Gorastanian. OK, uh, any questions on the active uh, colloid story? Surajit, am I perhaps? Um, uh, snowing the audience with too much detail? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, okay. I'm following right. it. Uh, okay. I'm struggling from time to time, but I'm following okay. it. Uh, and people can speak up. Uh, if they're... Okay, yeah. please feel free to ask me questions. Okay. I mean, I had, I had a, yes. uh, I mean, I don't know whether the question I should ask right now, but I have a question like so far you have not included entropy anywhere. Like oh, arrow so of time. So one way of saying it is that I've, I've not included noise anywhere, for example. You can take the same equations of motion that uh, we wrote ah, down. Okay, if you want right, to understand okay. the flocking transition, for instance, you have to yeah. study it with noise. Okay. Mm. In that sense, entropy is included. In another sense, the way entropy is included is that the way you derive the equations of motion for active matter is to start mm. from uh, an, a dissipation functional and build the equation from there. So there's a, the formal formulation of the dynamical equation for active matter is done in terms of uh, entropy production and so forth. I could give a whole another talk on that subject. So it is very much a part of it. 
in the particular but cases but noise woman, but yeah. as far as i understand noise uh, will only take care of the thermodynamic entropy right what about the information entropy that is the same thing right i mean meaning if i have a collection of particles moving around let's say i have a collection of particles mm. in contact with a thermal bath mm. that system has all the features that you are talking about i haven't discussed mm. it in this context uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it yeah. takes me too far okay. afield from what i'm saying to go very far into this uh, if you if by information entropy you are talking about things like uh, I mean, I'm not sure which what aspect of information entropy you're asking about here. Um, because to the extent that these are problems in statistical mechanics, yeah. um, uh, entropy in all senses of the word is part of the discussion. Actually, the question itself the question is not clear to me. Also, very so. Continue, please. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me talk now. Let me. Um, Oh dear! Something funny has happened here. I think my changing the talk to sixteen by nine has done some dreadful things. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Some, sometimes this happens. Uh, this is yeah. a gender. So let me talk about something that's uh, currently out there. Um, so there's been a lot of work on active particles in fluid media. Okay. Collections of motile bacteria or uh, biofilaments and motors in a fluid, like uh, Zornmi Jogic's uh, active pneumatic uh, suspensions and so forth. But uh, um, you can also imagine motile particles in an elastic medium. You know, imagine, for instance, that you've got uh, an epithelium uh, and you've got you know, maybe some cells are motile, or maybe all the cells are actively. Contracting and deforming the medium, uh, or imagine you've got particles, uh, cells crawling through the extracellular matrix. Uh, the interplay between motility and elasticity, uh, and the interaction between particles, self moving in a self-propelled manner through an elastic medium, uh, hasn't received as much attention as you might have thought. Uh, Sam Safran and company studied force dipoles in an elastic medium and specifically ignored, mono, ignored motility and they said that, well, you know, uh, that would require considering force monopoles, which is true, of course, if the system is on a substrate, but not in bulk. Silke Henkes and group recently studied motile particles, active Brownian particles in an elastic medium. The active Brownian particles produced a kind of forcing on the elastic medium, but their orientations were just dictated by their own, uh, that they didn't interact and change their orientation. The orientations were autonomous. So um, our interest, uh, Rahul Gupta's PhD work, Harsh Soni is a postdoc, Roshan is an experimental PhD student with Ajay Sood. Uh, our interest was in looking at motile particles in an elastic medium in a completely non-biological uh, realization. Um, and the idea is the following. So some years ago, and unfortunately, I don't have a slide on that, but that is old work. Some years ago, we had shown that we, we, we had studied a rather funny medium. We had studied a medium, the medium which I showed you a little while ago, and I'll try to resurrect if it comes back. Well, of course it won't, all right. Um, I'd shown you a solid surface, and beads spread on that surface and little tapered rods sitting on that surface. Those, what I showed you earlier were real experiments. These are simulation pictures. Oh, here it is. So this system, I'm not sure why it took so long to go on stream. So this system, when in the presence of these beads, you can see these beads are quite densely packed and in a very regular pattern. So this is actually a motile particle plowing its way through an effectively an elastic medium. Uh, since these, by the way, these are all, these are very macroscopic. That rod is five millimeters long and about a millimeter in diameter. The beads are a millimeter in diameter. The rods, the rod is brass, the beads are aluminum. And uh, these particles aren't executing Brownian motion, but they are jiggling around in some way. And therefore, 
as hard particles jiggling around in some way and packed at high concentration, they have some kind of elasticity. So this is our realization of a motile particle in an elastic medium. And now I hope I can, uh, yeah. This same system, if you had worked at slightly lower concentration, would have been a fluid medium of beads. And the rod, as it moves through it, would then, then sort of drag the medium. We've deliberate, we've tagged a few of the medium particles here, and we've shown that at low area fraction of beads, or comparatively low area fraction of beads, when the rod moves, it drags the medium. The medium is fluid. This flows set up by these rods moving through, an, uh, through this fluid medium, we had shown in some work several years ago, actually leads to an interaction amongst the rods that aligns them and produces a flock. It can produce a flock in which the concentration of motile particles is incredibly low. If you increase the packing, the area fraction of that medium, as I showed a few seconds ago, you get a crystalline array. And then when you have a particle moving through the medium, it does not drag the medium. So here were the B, this, this rod started out here and moved, and it didn't drag these guys with it. So it's doing, either it's doing nothing at all to the medium, or it's doing something other than, it's producing something other than flow in the medium. If you measure the flow in the case of the fluid medium, that is the liquid medium of beads, you can see fairly well-defined uh, two-lobe flows. In the case of the, of the densely packed medium, you see random small amounts of velocity, but nothing systematic. So what happens when you have one particle or several particles moving through an elastic medium. Do they talk to each other? So our interest in this problem actually was first, we just wrote down the equations of motion. So let's say you have particle. Let's imagine you have one motile particle with position R, with orientation N, moving through the medium. There should be a dot on top of that R, which has disappeared for some reason. R dot, the velocity of the active particle, has a magnitude B naught and points in the direction of that particle. That's something you see. You see these particles following their noses. Now you need to figure out an equation of motion for the medium, and you need to figure out what this motile particle does to the medium. So I'll just say it's highly plausible and no symmetry rules out this plausibility that if you've got one motile particle moving through a medium and that medium is on a substrate, then the equation of motion for the medium is that if you ignore inertia, the medium has a relaxational dynamics. U is a displacement field. Zeta is a damping constant. F is some effective elastic energy function, functional. And the motile particle provides a localized point force in the direction N. You can take this as conjecture if you like, or you can also take it as the lowest order term that symmetry allows in this system. Okay, so one particle moving through a medium produces a forcing on that medium. And this actually was also remarked by Silke Henkes and company. Um, the response of the particle to the medium is in two parts. One is because the medium has, uh, the medium is characterized by a displacement field. And you can imagine that the particle is reoriented because of the curvature of the crystal planes, either the, the bend or the splay of the crystal planes, or it lines up with the extensional axis of the lattice string. These are two kinds of couplings the particle can have. This coupling the particle would have even if it had no head tail distinction. This coupling it has only if the orientation is actually vectorial rather than just a director. So generically, these are the two kinds of coupling you can have. Epsilon here is the symmetric, symmetrized uh, string tensor. So the curvature of the medium produces a polar orientation. The strain of the medium produces an apolar orientation. This is clearly less important on long length scales than this, because this involves two derivatives of u. This involves one derivative of u. Can we figure out what two particles will do uh, in this picture? So I should say one thing that this is, this is very phenomenological. In particular, the kind of force the particle exerts in the medium must in principle be must microscopically be connected to its self-propelling velocity. But in this theory, we just put these two things in as independent uh, phenomenological parameters. Now, what you can do is ask, what is the destroy? What, what, what would this mean? This would mean that a moving particle doesn't produce a flow. Yes, yes. 
question okay sorry <clears throat> probably not a question Let's okay uh, it went away um, you can ask uh, clearly from this what the particle does is, is it strains the medium it doesn't cause flow it causes elastic distortions and uh, the important thing to note is that even though this object enters as a point force in this medium the medium itself Okay, let's do the following. Let's take one particle. Let's co-move with this one particle. In that case, the rate of change of the displacement field is just going to be the derivative, spatial derivative along the direction which the particle is moving. So the equation, the steady state displacement field equation in a frame co-moving with the particle is it's got elasticity, it's got the forcing that the particle puts on the medium, and it's got the fact that the particle is moving. So that means that the displacement field produced by this point force is not the Green's function of the elastic medium. It's a Green's function with a wake. It's a distortion field with a wake. Because this term has one fewer derivative than this, you'll get a wake from the, the length scale you get between these two terms. That displacement field has a very interesting form. You can solve it very easily. Uh, you can at my age, what you do is you look up Gratstein and Rizik and solve it. And when you do that, what you get is Bessel functions. But if you look closely at it, if you remember the asymptotic properties of Bessel functions, you will see that this exponential decay is cancelled behind the particle, but is, uh, sorry, am I saying it right? It, the exponential decay is cancelled behind the particle and exists in front of the particle. So behind the particle, the decay is a very is a one over root x or something, and in front of the particle, the decay is uh, uh, is exponential. The length scale is a length that comes out from the self-propelling velocity and elasticity and friction. So this is really cool. What it means is you've got a moving particle, and the distortion field in front of it is highly screened, and behind it, it leaves a nice, very substantial distortion field. And you can actually measure those. Uh, so far, we managed to measure them only in a sort of slavish recreation of the experimental system on the computer with vibrated granular matter simulated in detail. And uh, all the qualitative and many of the quantitative features are uh, reproduced. Suffice it to say, that's what happens. Um, you can then ask, which part of the orienting interaction on the particle? Now, now suppose you put in two particles. What you want to know is, what does the strain field produced by one particle do to the other particle? So uh, just to cut a long story short, the important part of the interaction turns out to be alignment along the extensional axis. Okay? And as a result, when you put two particles into the medium, if the medium is fluid, they actually repel each other. This is an old story. This is not what I just explained. They repel each other because of the flow fields they set up. But in the present case, in the simulation and the experiment, you can work out that you, you, you find empirically that they attract each other. And that attraction is basically what you get if one particle is realigned to point along the extensional axis of the strain produced by the other particle. Okay. Um, in the experiments and the simulations, the attraction is a bit probabilistic because these are noisy systems. So if the particles are too far apart, they'll just randomly rotate and lose their way. If they're close enough, they actually capture each other. Um, the interesting thing to note, again, is non-reciprocality. Why is that? Let's go back here. The, the, the direction the particle moves in isn't dictated by some uh, pair potential due to another particle. It's dictated by which way the particle points. The strain field reorients the particle orientation, that dictates which way the particle points. As a result, if you have two particles, let's say you have one particle starting from here and another particle starting from there. This guy is moving along, minding its own business. This particle is moving along like this. This particle gets caught up, gets reoriented by the large elastic distortions in the wake. The particle in front hardly senses the approach of the particle behind. So the particle in front doesn't deviate from its path, and this particle turns and captures. You can see this. Sorry, I don't seem to have the slide. You can see this very well in the experiments as well. I just forgot to put the experiments in. Uh, the particulate simulation is what I have here. Um, so
So just to reiterate, non-reciprocal, the moment you have a dynamics dictated by which way the particle is pointing and not dictated by a particle trying to move downhill to minimize its uh, strain energy or its you know, HLB energy or something like that, you set the stage for non-reciprocal interactions. One particle strain field rearranges the other particle and the particle then moves. And so even when you have two particles of the same type, the mere fact that one is in front and one is behind will give you an interaction between these two, which is very asymmetrical. This particle pursues that particle. This particle doesn't even know to escape. And uh, you know, so one, you can do a lot, a slightly more quantitative analysis. In particular, you can check that the elastic distortion fields and so forth agree with the with what we predicted and all that. But this is all I had actually planned to say uh, in this talk. So the elastic interactions of active polar particles are naturally non-reciprocal. Um, mechanically faithful simulations and experiments actually find clear evidence for this non-reciprocal capture, confirm the form of the strain field. So what I don't know is whether this is ever used in biology, because you certainly have motile objects. You even have chase and run dynamics of motile things in uh, the extra extracellular matrix. But there are so many signals in biology that whether this particular signal of a highly asymmetric elastic strain field is uh, reproduced in a living system, uh, I don't know. But it's hard to see why living matter would not take advantage of this idea. And uh, with that, I don't even think I have another slide. With that, because it's a three-part talk, I had three summaries. and I. Uh, and my talk will be happy to answer questions. So let's unmute ourselves and give uh, Sridham a round of uh, applause. Um, we are open to questions now. Uh, so, so please feel free to ask questions. So I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Um, thank you. So actually two questions. Um, so both are related to noise. So when Professor Ramaswamy was talking about noise, um, is there a distinction between state dependent multiplicative noise and noise due to say the external interaction additive noise? And does it, does it particularly matter in the context of a non-reciprocal interaction? Honest answer is I don't know. Uh, state dependent or multiplicative noise is generic, actually, even in even in you know collections of uh, ordinary Brownian particles, right? If you write down the equation for the concentration for the fluctuating concentration field, even of just n independent Brownian particles, uh, the correct description of the noise there is a state dependent noise. So the degree we actually don't have, a, frankly, we don't understand the degree to which multiplicative noise makes a difference. It emerges naturally in many of these problems, and we don't know. Okay, thank you. I mean, to give a specific example, for in, in flocking models, the models of flocking in which long-range order has been demonstrated theoretically in stochastic field, in you know, using field theoretic techniques, multiplicative noise has been ignored in those. Okay. Okay. I mean, and the reason for the question was because you know, because the non-reciprocality emerges from the internal interaction right so so therefore one would one would think that the multiplicative noise might might um, you know might, might be interesting in that context and, yeah, and so I'm, one, I'm trying to agree i i it's uh, there's i i i just i don't know what it will do but I, i'm inclined to agree that it might matter right thank you and the second question is uh, along the same lines um non-brownian particularly fractional processes say like levy flies because i think some of the uh, you you was i thought you were saying that you know some of the uh, the the videos that you showed that it wasn't exactly brownian but it was doing a rather wiggly you know so is there do, do you think uh that not fractional processes say precisely uh, levy flights type of processes would have any bearing um in in this context again non-reciprocality Good question. I haven't ever, I haven't actually seen, um, you know, the sort of uh, stochastic PD lit, uh, problems where you solve for kinetics of phase transitions. I've essentially never seen anyone 
make a serious attempt to uh, solve those with uh, levy noise right from the start. I mean, there are some processes, you start out with the equations of motion uh, for say ordinary boring white noise and some emergent quantities might show other kinds of statistics. But I haven't seen cases in which we've, anyone has tried to solve for phase transition physics with levy noise at the outset. Thank you. Yeah. Good questions. I, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and just to add, give it some context, you know, we've been trying to understand this from the point of view of uh, robotics warming, you know, uh -huh. so, so, so even, even at the level of simulations, we don't run any experiments, but, but even there, you know, to, to, to have these t different types of processes seems to be interesting uh, to get a bunch of robots to, to mimic, um, you know, natural, natural behavior. Yeah. Thank so you. By the way, for some reason, I'm not able to see who, maybe I should stop sharing. And then I can see who is asking the question. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hi. This is, this is Hi. Subhu, Subhu Ramakrishnan, University of Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? So one of the questions, Sridham, I wanted to throw out was, uh, surely you've thought quite a bit about it is the role of boundaries, especially in something like problem three, where you are able to chart out so much. Um, how does boundary effects come into play in these systems and how would you model them uh, in the current framework? So, I mean, so, bound, so the point is, in any of these problems with motile particles, boundaries are seriously important. So if you, suppose you have a, a closed, let's say a, a circular geometry or an annular geometry or whatever it is, then inevitably, given enough time, anything that's motile is going to settle down. If you have an ordered state of a system, if, mm -hmm. you had, if you have a state which in an ideal world with periodic boundary conditions was actually just homogeneous motion, in a closed geometry of the sort that you're talking about, you would end up getting a vortex. So boundaries matter a lot. And boundary effects somehow, because, because these are motile systems, boundaries matter more than they do in ordinary equilibrium system. Secondly, uh, in these uh, phoretic problems, for instance, at low concentrations, the interactions, because they are through a diffusion field, are long range. So again, the boundary matters. Um, and you can, I mean, you can model them only in the sense that you have to put them in with boundary conditions. Great. Right. Yeah. There's nothing very really clean you can do, unfortunately, with boundaries. Okay. The, the other question I had, and this comes really from a line of thinking that uh, has become important to me because I've been looking at social systems. Uh, often in social systems, and that's probably true in these systems as well, uh, particularly in the biological context, there is always a third variable that ultimately drives uh, two agents or two particles. Uh, there is some third or fourth or fifth benefit at the back that drives it. So in other words, I don't know if I'm making sense, but the the, the interactions that you were saying, orientation along along the along the wake or whatever, uh, that that's like that's a driver, right? So so that's an important mm -hmm. part of the uh, of of what fits in the dynamics. But in social systems, what happens a lot is that there are hidden variables, the third or fourth or fifth variables, which benefit the system. So so in other words, the system has to be reparameterized in terms of these other variables, and and those kind of those kind of things would seem to be very important in these kind of active matter systems because, um, you know, typical physical science-based interactions is is, a, is certainly what the first level, but the moment you dig deeper into the system, there are other underlying benefits that actually drive the dynamics of the system, benefits or costs, uh, and that should be very important from a biological uh, perspective, I'd imagine. So, I mean, uh, the point is, if one was model, so it depends on what you mean. In, you know, in simple models of living systems, the, the benefits in the short run are nutrient, in the long run are reproductive success. So, if you want to study models like this, only, you know, in sort of very limited time steady states, you could introduce something like a nutrient field or something. If you wanted to study them on evolutionary time scales, and people have done this, people have taken fairly simple flocking models and even looked at the kinds of evolutionary steady states, evolutionary stable strategies that 
emerge if you take a collection of particles, endow them with some attribute like gradient following ability, and then let them run and then let them reproduce by an amount that's uh, proportional to how far up the gradient they've got, assuming the gradient is full. And then the ones that reproduce retain those characteristics by heredity and then look at So people have done that kind of thing. I, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but. Uh, yeah, in the biological context, that would be the, that have, would be the uh, analogy. Done things of that sort uh, as one quite nice modification of standard flocking models. That means I the see. models then in which on uh, intergenerational time scales, parameters in simple models of the, uh, you know, the, the type I showed you, which have. Uh, mm -hmm. Iram, if you have yes. too many parameters in the system driving the yes. uh, dynamics, can't you take them into account like a noise? I mean, like, because it leads to a complicated dynamic, so it will be like. No, no, but here, uh, here the, I think the, 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 here the idea that, that what Surjit is asking was whether uh, the, if there are specific benefits that you want to look at, then you need to keep track of mm -hmm. those. And I was giving an I, I The one example I'm familiar with was where mm -hmm. just this, the, the model has the same number of parameters, but different agents might have different values of that parameter, mm -hmm. which is again, oh, yes, yeah. heterogeneity. Yes, natural. yes. And then uh, in succeeding generations, the uh, values are the, num the, the population numbers uh, are uh, updated by how successful a given agent was in gathering uh, nutrient, let's say, going up a nutrient gradient. That kind of, that's not my work by any means, but people have done that kind of thing. Yeah, actually, there are a lot of questions I had. Uh, I mean, I cannot ask all the questions, but just uh, like uh, curiosity, like, for example, one question comes in mind is like, uh, so this kind of thing is also applicable to stock market. Like, this is also living active matter, right? So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's been, you know, I, no, I've not, there's a large literature on that kind of thing, but I'm, I'm not an expert. Agent based models yeah. Uh, yeah. with, you know, adaptive control system systems and all that. Yeah, I'm saying that. that yeah. I think, I mean, I think that's a big and serious literature. I don't know it very well. Uh, and no, that actually the second, predates many yeah. of these things. The second question I had it, I mean, like, I have many questions, but I, I can't, don't want to talk about all of them right now. But one comes immediately to mind is like you were talking about long range interactions. And there are issues about long range in, uh, extensivity of uh, things uh, in case of long range interactions. So, like, uh, uh, that kind of idea will enter somewhere in your uh, yeah, studies? So, um, I think the reason it's not as serious a problem here is that if you've got collection, if you, if you have so at non-zero concentration, uh, the, the presence of other particles themselves, uh, you know, cuts off the diffusion fields. So, but you can, you know, you can write down equations of motion Coupled equations of motion for the motile particles and uh, the solute. So in that case, everything is local. If you keep, if you work on time scales where you keep track of the solute, the diffusion fields dynamics, then the interactions ultimately become local because each particle, it's only to the extent that the diffusion field everywhere is instantaneously determined by where the uh, self, you know, the autophoretic particles are, then it's a long range interaction problem. And uh, either finite concentration of these particles or keeping track of the diffusion field dynamics, those are ways of making the problem less pathologically long ranged in that sense. But I see. But if you do treat these things as directly long range, you get many of the same funny features that you get in Coulomb systems or in gravitational systems. Yeah, so yeah. Many of the yeah. difficult, not difficult, many, many of the features, if you like. Uh, if you look exactly. at an yeah. earlier paper of ours in 2014, yeah. we show that in these, um, the collective behavior of these active colloids, you can get analogs of the genes instability, you can get analogs of plasma oscillations, all those things are there because you've got one of our interaction. And it's- Just yes, one last so. question. Yeah. One last question. Like mm -hmm. uh, now suppose if you think about the quantum system, I, I saw somewhere you mentioned quantum active matter. So do you think like uh, this many body localization kind of thing scenario will also enter here and all that? I, again, I think no. I think MBL is These are just, because yeah. it's not a driven system and it's quench disorder. Mm. Uh, <coughs> so I don't think 
Mm. Yeah, those are, disordered, those are disordered and not driven. Those are systems that fail to formalize. So I think that's a different regime. Um, I think the case, the, the situation where you can find effective active matter descriptions are in strongly driven quantum systems, for some class of strongly driven quantum systems, mm -hmm. in which you allow dissipation to happen, you will get an effective active matter description. Okay. So the other extreme is these Floquet systems where everything gets sent off to the infinite temperature fixed point. That's, so I'm saying there are ends of these problems which resemble active matter and ends of them which don't uh, resemble okay. active matter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any further questions? If not, may I ask you unmute yourself and let's give uh, Sriram a round of applause for a fantastic uh, Saturday morning talk here in, in the US. Uh, th thanks very much. Ed, uh, and, and, and thanks for showing up on Saturday morning. <laughs> Thank you. It's Saturday night for you guys. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sriram. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.